down. Reel down again. Little step. Little oh my God. One or two at a time. That's, that's Let's insane. Go. Hey everybody, Caleb here with the Fish and Fuel Podcast and uh, welcome back to the first relaunch of the Fish and Fuel Podcast in over a year and I have a very special guest, one that everybody knows in our industry Mr. Zach Royce, the two-time back-to-back state record holder here in North Carolina. Zach, if you would, even though everybody seems to know your name, give an introduction, what you do full-time, and how long you've been doing it. Uh, so I started uh, Blues Brothers Guide Service uh, about nine years ago um, and eventually became full-time doing that. Uh, started out part-time guiding. And... Uh, I guess been doing it full time about six years, maybe seven now, um, and uh, yeah, uh, it's it's been a been a great uh, ride, and I feel like a lot of great things to come in the future with it too. Absolutely, I totally agree. And Zach, one of the the things about the Fish and Fuel podcast is we do an introduction and then we just dive right into it. Me personally, I'm not a big fan on podcasting or listening to something where it's a 10 minute introduction and I got to fast forward it. So thank you for introducing yourself, but we're just going to dive right into some questions and awesome. stuff, man. We just want to pick your brain, just kind of get some knowledge off of you. And uh, a lot of people have messaged me on Facebook and on different places and uh, they want to know Everybody out there is trying to catch a 100-pound fish. I mean, you've got professionals and you've got guys on the bank. They want to catch a really big catfish. Before I ask you, how many catfish have you caught over 100 pounds? 100 pounds or over, how many? Uh, well, most recently, uh, it would be four total from 100 pounds. Four catfish over 100 pounds pounds that's right all since uh 2015 that's insane you know to catch one of those is a lifetime achievement and for you to have four and then you have two back-to-back -back state records in north carolina for blues catfish You're right so pretty much with the odds booking a trip with blues brothers god service you're probably the greatest chance of somebody getting on a 100-pound fish and learning how to catch or, or, or target a 100-pound fish. Well, that's, that's true. Um, that's one thing I do have complete control over is I can always teach someone whatever they want to know about targeting the bigger fish. Um, you know, you, when you go out, you can't control what bites, but uh, the chances, it's always there. I mean, I'm on a fishery that produces monster fish and, yeah you know right here on lake gaston in north carolina and right it's funny you say that i had somebody uh comment on one of the uh videos under the comments and they said man how do you pick a good guide because it seems like every guide i've ever booked with they say man you should have been here yesterday should have been here yesterday and what i commented back zach was look Use that time where he's a God. He's not God. He can't make fish bite. So That's right. use that time. If somebody's coming out with you and it's a slow day, that's a time for somebody to ask you questions like, Zach, why are we here? What, why did you choose this spot? Well, you know, and that's those days, uh, those are often your best uh, opportunities to learn something new because, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're grinding Not as much it out. going on. Yeah, you're, you're trying to figure out, okay, you know, uh, I was on this pattern for the last week. What are the fish doing now? And if you can ever get, I don't know, I feel like that's the big majority of, of targeting, especially trophy fish, is just uh, putting together patterns. Yeah. And a lot of it's based off just time on the water. Um, yeah. You know, past experiences just out there fishing. 
But um, if you can get that mindset, you know, of why, you know, why am I going to fish this area on this particular day, this time of year, um, you know, but those moments don't happen unless you have some tough days. That's you right. Go out every day and catch fish in the same spot. You're exactly right. You're not going to learn anything. I mean, yeah, you're sure, exactly, that'd be fun. But you're exactly right. <laughs> you're not going to learn. You're exactly right. And somebody can speed up that process a hundred times if they come and book a trip with you. Oh, absolutely. Or book book with a guide, especially somebody with a rap sheet of four fish, 100 pounds and over, state record titles, and then how many 80s and 90s you've put in the boat. I mean, it's just unreal. You know, I think somebody really misses a big opportunity if they get on this boat. Now, we all want to catch fish. When I go out of town and when I book a guide trip, we want to catch fish. But right. if you step on the boat with somebody like you and say, these are the best odds of really catching monster fish and having a good day on the water. If it's slow, I'm going to pick his brain because I know Zach didn't just close his eyes and pull up his unit and say, and eh, we're fishing there. <laughs> no, it's, that didn't happen. You're exactly right. Um, you know, when you pay a guide to go out for the day, um, if you're someone that actually fishes on your own, I mean, mm -hmm. I take plenty of people that they may not even fish on their own. They just want to go out and catch some fish, don't even care what size. That's fine, you know. But if you're someone that you're booking the trip um, and, and you have your own boat and fish as much as you can, whether it be once a month or, you know, every weekend, the, the value of that guide trip is the knowledge, not going out and catching fish. That's it's right. really not. I mean, I hope we do catch, you yep. know, fish, obviously. But, um, you know, it, like if I'm going somewhere else, and I want to learn, and I book with a guide. I don't really care if we catch anything. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to get uh, you know insight on why the guide is doing yes whatever we're doing. You know, Absolutely, why, you know everything about the trip. Absolutely, uh, I just want to kind of be, you know, almost in his head. Like you know, why is he picking this spot? Absolutely. Well, let's get in your head for a minute here, Zach. You know, people watching this podcast, they want little nuggets of information that they can put in their tool belt to where they may not live on Lake Gaston or fish Lake Gaston, but catfish are catfish and, and, and conditions um, apply in other bodies of water where they can take some knowledge and put it on their body of water. Zach, let's say we're in your boat right now and we're about to head out to the lake. Kind of walk us through. You're going to fire those units up and What's the first thing that you're going to do to try to pick out a fishing spot? Try Now, you're a guide. You've got your routine. You've got your things you look for. But kind of take your guide knowledge and then kind of remember, Zach, when you were learning the lake to answer my question, what are you going to do? Are you going to fire up your unit and turn on your lake maps, the current conditions, the water temperature? Are you going to be looking kind of shallow, kind of deep? Kind of walk us through like, what are you going to do if we set out right now to try to put a 100-pound fish in the boat? And that's what I'm going to title this podcast is how to catch a 100-pound or how to target a 100-pound catfish. What's your thought process in trying to make that happen? Uh, so, you know, when you when you fish full-time and, uh, and I fish, even on my days off, I'm usually out there, you know, trying to put together patterns. So that that's a big that's a big part of it for me at this point, but before I didn't have that option. When you're guiding, or before I even started guiding, let's just go back to, I worked a, a normal, you know, 40-hour job at a, at a factory. Um, I had my boat hooked up. I'd, I'd work Monday through Fridays. A lot of times I had my boat hooked up on Friday. I went straight from work to the lake and I would fish. I mean, I would literally stay on the boat the whole weekend and uh, put time in just trying to learn as much as I could but at that point in time when I was I guess you could say getting uh, you know serious about uh, targeting the, the trophy fish the trophy catfish I spent a lot of time on the Navionics app on my phone and uh, we were on the computer just looking you know to kind of studying the the, the charts yeah uh, Navionics uh, you know, like the Navionics Platinum, it shows your old road beds. The Platinum has the one foot contour. One foot contour. And that's important. Oh, man. I, I tell people all the time, they get on the boat and they're like, man, you got, you know, nice electronics. Uh, I bet that really helps a lot. And they're looking at the sonar. 
Uh, the sonar does help. Um, I use it more for catching bait, actually. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I'll mark a big fish and catch it. That, that does happen. But 99% of the fish I catch, my big fish, I don't even mark them. Um, so I'm not really, you know, I'm not, I'm not really using the sonar as much as I am the chart. I'm, I'm fishing structure, contours. Um, that's what I'm focusing on more than anything. And so that, that's, uh, I mean, really, that's what I study. You know, when I'm off the water, I still do it. I sit at home and I know the lake. I mean, God, if I feel like I know it, like the back of my hand now, just from the hours I put in, but I'm still always open to learning, uh, you know, and I, I still find new areas all the time, but I'm, I'm sitting at home, you know, when I'm not on the boat looking at Navionics, and I, sometimes I'll come across something like, man, that was right under my nose the whole time. Yep. I never noticed that. Yep. Go out the next day, like on a day off when I'm experimenting more, and, uh, you know, go to that spot, catch a big fish, and then, you know, obviously make a note for the future. That's and over right. time, you get more and more areas um, that you tend to catch these bigger fish. But then it comes down to every year is different. So, you know, one year. Some years, winter's warmer. Some years, right. we got snow by now. That's, that's it. And a lot of it, too, is uh, how much uh, flow we're getting. So how much rain we've had. You know, if the water's muddy. Um, fish generally the bait's generally going to be up a little shallower more in the creeks so you know you've got all these different factors and uh you know you, you get to where you've got a million different areas that you've caught good fish and uh it it's it comes down to um printing together the pattern based on the current conditions and then also don't get too trapped in in that mindset you know like if if what you're doing is not working all right man it's time to do something different yeah like just because you had success yeah um you know what worked well for you in the past isn't necessarily best for the future yeah and, and that's, that's something right. i tell you man this uh this season i have really opened up my mind more um you know i feel like i almost got stuck for a while and it, it, it's easy to do i feel like in anything you, that you do in life but um, I've, I've opened my mind up more to, to just trying different things and, uh, you know, learning as much as I can. And, Absolutely. And this, that paid off my biggest fish ever here recently. So. Absolutely. Cause you just caught 112 pound blue, like just last week, yeah, right was, before this podcast. And Zach with, with four fit and congratulations, by the way, that's thanks, amazing. Appreciate I mean, it. number four over a hundred, Jesus Christ. Um, and you know, with four fish over a hundred, that is more data than just about anybody that I know. What is something, is there anything in common with these hundred pound fish, Zach, with either how you caught them, like what technique we're using to catch them, and then kind of like, not a location, but you mentioned lake maps, where the lake map shows you the contours. Is it a like a, a a rise is it a a hump is it creek channels what is something is there anything in common well so it you know if we were going for number five is there anything that would link it together to get number five it it seems to me that uh, my, my bigger fish um not just not even just the hundreds but my my biggest fish i've caught overall uh they're usually relating to certain creeks and uh, when I say that I don't mean that they're necessarily in the creek okay but when they're not in there I feel like they're hanging nearby there's certain creeks that seem to just be a magnet for bigger fish mm -hmm. and that's something I've kind of a pattern I feel like I've put together in the last couple of years is chasing what I feel like is possibly the same groups of fish um, from in the creeks to the main lake um, and, and that might be one you know one month they're way back in the creek and then the bait moves and the conditions change and they may be on the flat um, between the creek mouth and the channel or they may be in the channel itself but what I've what I've really started doing a lot more of is targeting um, whether I'm you know on a main lake flat or the main river channel the old river channel I'm usually fishing those near those creeks 
that I have had so much success in uh, with bigger fish. Um, and you know, like I said, I think I think the fish are using those crates to go in there to feed, and the bait's always moving. But uh, you know, I, I caught my two the, st the state record fish. I caught them in the same creek. Um, they were pretty far back in there, but it was uh, that December. We had a ton of rain, ton of water flow, super muddy water, probably the muddiest I've ever seen it. And as I said earlier, that pushes bait up shallower. So, you know, the fish were on a creek pattern and they stayed in that pattern for a while. Whereas uh, when I caught the 112 recently, um, now the water started to get a little bit muddy. We've had some rain, but before that, we had a super dry season. Water's been low, hardly any flow at all. I haven't been running the dams much. Uh, yeah. Gaston is dammed on both ends. So the flow is, you know, strictly the, the major current that we get is all from what the generation does. Right, from the dams. From the dams. Um, so it, it's a different pattern, um, you know, this December compared to 2015 when I caught those record fish. Um, so I've been fishing more main lake. And, uh, you know, like I said, targeting uh, flats between these creeks in the river channel and also um the river channel itself yeah but um i'm you know that's what i've i guess been focusing on more than anything is is uh is these creeks i'm relating to the creeks more than i am you know like a certain sure drop off or anything now there, absolutely there, there's times when you know the fish do get on like a really tight ledge but um yeah, some of my biggest fish actually come from blues or open water. Yeah. You know, predators roaming around a lot, move a lot. And, uh, you know, that's another thing I've learned uh, here in the last year or so is, is don't always get caught up as much as I love my Navionics, my charts and following contours. You know, don't. Don't get locked in on that all the time because sometimes they're right out in the middle of the channel. Middle Especially of the in the flat. summertime, Bo. Oh, man, summer and early when fall. When the thermocline forms. You know, Zach, you may remember this. I don't know. Um, on Kerr Lake, there were some striper fishermen years ago that were pulling uh, baits at like three mile an hour in like 70 foot of water. And they had the baits at 20 foot and they caught like a 109 or yep. 108. And... Um, uh, Kevin Davis, a good friend of mine, on a slip barber, caught his like a 105 or another like a 108, and it was out in the middle of open water. So That's right. just to validate, you know, what you're saying, it, it's something where guys can think they have to fish on the bottom. Absolutely. And um, yeah. during the summertime, like, that's just not the case. And even even sometimes in the winter, uh, we don't have a thermocline now, uh, and the thermocline is, is obviously the biggest factor catching suspended fish. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, even in the winter, when the fish get down towards the lower end, the, you know, towards the, the deepest end here, um, a lot of times they won't be down on the bottom when they're in, let's just say, 70 feet of water because the bait, the bait's up higher. You're not going to usually see the bait down mm -hmm. that deep. Mm -hmm. You know, and the bigger fish are normally hanging closer to that bait. Mm -hmm. And uh, I almost feel like you're really big fish. Uh, personally, I've never caught one on the bottom deeper than probably 60 feet. Mm -hmm. um, and that's pushing it. You know, I, I feel like when you get to a certain point, maybe it's not comfortable for them at, yeah. a, at that depth. I don't know, but yeah. uh, could also be a lot to do with your bigger bait fish, uh, perch, gizzard shad, um, things of that nature that your bigger fish are typically gonna be eating. That's right. They're also gonna be up shallower. Right, you know? right. So your thread fin, catch a lot of small fish under the thread fin. Um, like this time of year, if somebody says, man, I wanna go out and catch a, uh, just as many five to 10 pound fish as I possibly can. I'm gonna go down to the deep water and uh, fish deep under the thread fin schools. Yep. But when I do that, the, the chances of catching a really big fish are super slim. Right, right. And Zach, when you mentioned, you know, sometimes you're fishing way back in the creek sometimes you're fishing mid creek sometimes you're fishing the mouth of a creek or out in front of a creek you know how does an angler kind of figure out where to start now those fish if they're out in the front mid or in the back i would imagine that probably has a lot to do with water temperature 
that yep. moves them forward and backward. And the water temperature is obviously probably driving the bait to do something, and they're following that. I think a lot of people think that catfish get cold, and they're like, "Oh, I got to come back out here in the main lake where it's warmer." <laughs> when really they don't, they don't give a crap. They just want to go after where the bait's at. That's right. They're tough. Do I you mean, think the weather is what drives them further in, out, and and changes their stuff and your approach? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, water temperature and also, like I said, the, the clarity the and clarity. water flow. Um, because you're basically, it all starts, the food chain all starts with plankton, right? So, mm -hmm. um, Shady plankton. You get it, you get a lot of, if you get a lot of water flow, you've, you've got all these nutrients and, and everything's flowing in out of the backs of these feeder creeks. Very true, yeah. Well, well here comes your bait, um, you know, and that could be gizzard shad, thread fin, you know, herring, whatever you have, whatever species you have in your body of water. But um, that's where it all starts. And uh, because even, you know, I use a lot of white perch for bait. Mm -hmm. We have so many in here. That's a, that's one of the main forage for the big blues. You know, it's one of the main things. And uh, same with, with crappy. That's another great bait. But they eat the thread fin, your little butter bean, small thread fin shad. Well, those are just like gizzard shad. They, they may have different, yep. you know, patterns, but at the end of the day, they're all feeding on plankton. Exactly. So that food chain all starts, you know, with what's going on with plankton, and that that's all. That's just it's a chain reaction. You follow the plankton because I remember when I first learned about plankton, um, I was like, okay, so gizzard shad are feeding on plankton. You know, sunlight and heat grows plankton on on, on the top, and then and 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 that change reaction and. You find out, okay, plankton, and then the bait fish are eating that, and then they the fish just get bigger. That's right. And yeah, then the crappie, small, and yeah. then you go it, on it to the next. And, and, you know, a lot of people, I'll, I'll have somebody on the boat say, uh, oh, well, the wind's blowing like crazy. You know, it's blowing across, let's just say, it's, it's hitting the uh, the north bank. Um, that, isn't that going to push all the, the shad up on the bank? I say, no. I say, it's not pushing the shad. It's pushing the plankton. You know, and they're and, just going where the plankton goes. Exactly. Yeah. Yep, so, yeah, I ain't never seen the wind be blowing hard, and underneath the water, fish are just getting like. <laughs> that's right. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's they just, don't feel it. They ain't feeling that. No, no, no. But that whatever's on top of the water, leaves, plankton, anything, it's getting driven the way the wind's blowing. That's it. Good and, point. And that's, uh, you know, that's where it can get so complicated with uh, with fishing, and it, it's when it, when it comes down to something as tiny. As, a, as plankton and something that I don't know if there's a whole lot of uh, scientific, <laughs> you know, info, information on, uh, on like patterns of plankton. I, I'm not sure. Maybe but... that'd be a good podcast. We get a biologist <laughs> up in here that does uh, plankton. That'd be a that, good, be a good man, lesson. That, that's, you know, that's really that'd where it all topic. starts. So, yeah, you're right. Um, but, but that makes it, that does make it complicated because we're trying to, we're trying to figure out these bigger fish that are all keyed into these little microscopic. <laughs> That's exactly that, right. That the wind and current, everything affects so much. And, You're right. You're you exactly know. right. And Zach, let's talk about the wind for just a second. Let's hit on that. Let's say you're the west. You're the the west bank. Um, you pull up in a creek, or you pull up on your uh, this area of the lake that you want to fish. You're the west bank, and I'm the east bank. If the wind is blowing towards you you know you said that that will push plankton to get stacked up on that side uh and and the bait fish will naturally congregate you know over there and then you'll have catfish and other species fish how long in your opinion does the wind blow in one direction when you're checking the weather app uh, if it's been blowing for maybe like one day west and then it switches back east, are you going to go check the west bank or is it you looking for like a number of days where the wind is consistently blown in one direction where you say, look, this clearly has to stack some plankton up to create bait fish to create predators. What's right. your opinion on that? How many, what, what do you it, look for when you're looking at wind? And to me, it seems like it, uh, it, it takes like consecutive days of the same direction to really yeah, make a big difference. Like a few days. Right. So right. especially here, like I can think of a, one good example is when we get a, a big west wind, which we get a lot of that, um, and it's blowing straight down the lake, 
um, for like multiple days. A lot of times, like this time of year, it'll push your, uh, your plankton down, which, you know, ends up having your bait and whatnot uh, down towards like the Gaston Dam end, which mm -hmm. is the lower end. But that's because the, the, the bait, everything's kind of hanging in this general area of the lake already in the deeper water right now it's warmer right um so you, you get a lot of a lot of bait and a lot of fish um down on this end when it when you've got you know the cooler water temps but it blows you've got like a a five or six mile stretch of just the straightaway um all the way down to the dam there where if the wind's blowing out of the west you know it's just man it's it's really got a lot of momentum too it's it's really building a lot of uh you know a lot of force but yeah. uh then they've got current running on top of it because they, they always run the dam even on a dry year they're going to run it at least a little bit pretty much every day right um so you're right. always going to have some current flowing down as well but uh, those two things together i've seen it where like three or four days especially of a west a strong like a 10 20 mile an hour wind mm -hmm. um you'll come out and start cruising down this end of the lake, you're like, man, where'd all the bait go? You get down there to that end, it's just like, wow, it's just stacked up. Yeah. And uh, this time of year, with when you've got birds around, you'll see them diving on it too, and it's just uh, everything's just gorging. But um, absolutely, man, I've I've seen that. I don't know how many times in the winter, where uh, you had so much dead water, and then you get down to that, especially like a, a point down uh -huh. that end of the lake, yes, some kind of yep, really big shelf. And the bait is just stacked up and fish everywhere. And it feels like it feels like every fish in the lake is in that one area. That's right. So it comes down to if you're not in that area, you're in trouble. You're not catching hardly anything. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And you, know? you may have somebody that's not putting these puzzle pieces together like what we're talking about on this podcast. And they go out and they say, man, I just, man, the fish just won't bite today. And then they get on Facebook and they're just like, well, Zach is God's chosen people and he just shines down on him and he's catching these fish. When you're putting these puzzle pieces together and if somebody applies what you're saying to their fishing, instead of choosing the wrong spot, they may say, hey, look, this matches up. You know, I'm going to try this, what Zach said, and try to put a big fish in the boat or at least a number of fish. Yeah, so, yeah, that's right. I mean, um, and that, that's happened to me before. You know, it's, it's always humbling when uh, you go out and have a tough day and your, your fishing buddy's out and... Uh, He's like, man, I ended up having a great day. I caught a 50 pounder or whatever. But, yep. And then you're like, ah, what did I do wrong? And it, but it's, you know, the fish, I'm not going to say there's not tough days because, you know, conditions can make fishing tough. But um, there's always some biting somewhere. And mm -hmm. you, you go fish a tournament, uh, a, a bigger tournament with a lot of anglers fishing. And, uh, you know, there's always going to be that guy that comes in with that, you know. It is. <laughs> it is. way in and. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And if you're like me, your best days are always before and after a tournament. <laughs> so <laughs> you never have to worry about me. And, uh, you know, if I was, if, even back in the day when I was, I was fishing tournaments and stuff, I, I knew I was going to catch a big one if I did terrible in the tournament. Yeah, if I go the next day. If I go the next day. That's generally how it goes but there. But putting these pieces together and, and doing what you're talking about will absolutely help a guy in a tournament setting or if he's just going out to have a good time with his buddies or taking out his family. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, man, it's just been killer points already that, I mean, that you brought into this. And, Zach, when it comes down to the bait, and, and, you know, we've talked on bait a lot here, and that's where it all starts to try to go catch a catfish. With these big fish, and, and I'll even go down to, like, from 70 to uh, your biggest so far, which is the 112 at this point. Right. Um, you know, that's dozens of fish, a lot between 70 and 112 pounds that, that you've put in this boat with four of them being over 100. Is there anything like in correlation with the bait size? Do you think that um, you've caught more on like a smaller bait or like a big bait? Cat fishermen seem to think a lot of times, and I know when I was starting out is you got to throw these big baits and there's times they want big baits. But based off what you've seen, and I know it has to do with the conditions, but do you think smaller baits for like winter time or bigger baits? You know, what is yeah. your opinion? Um, so that that's a 
that's a good question there because uh i used to be the same like starting out you know i just you would assume bigger bait bigger fish oh dude yeah um, but a, a good buddy of mine he told me a while back elephants eat peanuts yep and uh <laughs> you know it's, i got to thinking about it and say well you know i feel like uh there's a lot of days where i've caught really big fish um on a on a smaller bait and I, I can't say for sure but it that fish may have been more likely to eat that smaller bait mm -hmm. um, because it, it already fed you know it, it had a lot uh ate, you know eating some bigger bait or whatever and was had kind of a full belly yeah and uh, didn't want a big you know like a whole perch or a shad head or whatever uh it, it may have been more likely to bite that small bait yeah um but it definitely changes throughout the year, you know, because their metabolism, it does slow down some Yeah. Uh, in colder water. So I, I have noticed, like, earlier in the fall, man, I was pulling some giant baits, um, you know, like, just huge shad heads, perch heads, whatever, um, or, or half a, you know, half a crappy, you know, big, big slabs yeah. of bait. Yeah, oh, yeah. And the water at that time, though, was in the 60s, um, you know, mid-60s, that's like, like kind of prime feeding time they're feeding really heavily mm -hmm. i'm moving around a lot still yep and uh it you know it seemed to get attention from the bigger fish a little bit better yeah but uh with that being said you know my four fish uh, 100 pounds and over have actually been on smaller baits right um not not a little fillet the size of my thumb or anything a little you know tiny chunk but um small pieces uh, you know, like a smaller perch, uh, like a two inch head. piece or, or like yeah, a like three inch, two or... to three inch pieces of bait. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I try to keep track of, uh, what section of the bait fish I'm catching my fish on. And, um, well, as far as I can remember, I know, uh, the two state records, I, I remember the first one was on a head and the second was on a tail chunk, both small like two to three inch pieces. And then um, the most recent one, the 112 came off a small perch head as well. And uh, all those big fish have also been uh, drifting. I meant to mention that earlier when you said, is there any particular thing that I've noticed with my bigger fish? So all, cause that's, that's really cool. So all the fish that you've caught, all four, a hundred pounds and over have been from drifting. That's Put right. the trolling motor down and putting the planter boards out and putting a spread out and i noticed you got a different set of planter boards up here and uh what are those the those are the the alpha boards um started working with uh with jamie at alpha boards a couple years ago to on, on designing helping design test those well if there's anybody that'll put miles on those uh alpha boards it uh it, it'll be you because <laughs> you're always drifting and so all of them come off of drifting and what speed do you drift at so generally uh you can't go wrong with like half a mile an hour 0.5 mm -hmm. 0 0.5 I, that's where i always tell people uh if you got to pick one speed to go just do that all year um i mean you know people have they just told me in the past oh in the winter you're not going to catch big fish drifting you know they're not going to chase a bait you need to, if you do drift you need to slow down you know like just crawl like 0.2 0.3 mm-hmm and uh, it was about six, maybe seven years ago, we had a super cold winter. And uh, the lake, actually, a lot of it was frozen over. Like all your creeks were just, you couldn't even, there was only one ramp I, that was thawed out enough to yeah. even get out. And so that's the coldest water I've personally fished in here um, so far. And the water temple in the main lake was like 35 36 degrees barely above freezing okay so i go out never fished in water that cold before i'm like ah this might be tough you know i don't know i might have to anchor fish and really be patient yeah and uh start drifting and just had an awesome day and i remember the first fish i caught i was on a uh, charter that day but one of the first ones we caught was like 30 something pounds nice fish and I looked down, it was a little bit of a breeze. I looked down at my uh, GPS speed, we're going 0 0.7, 0 0.8. You know, caught a good fish and, um, you know, 
still I'd, I'd like a target about half a mile an hour. But then right. they told me, I said, okay, that fish hit going a little bit quicker. And uh, the rest of the day, uh, the next couple of days, um, water temp stayed about the same. It took a while to warm back up, but I drifted, you know, stayed around half a mile an hour and uh, ended up catching one. It was either 52 or 58 pounds. It was over 50. I remember that, um, you know, at 36 degree water, drifting half a mile an hour. Um, and that, that fish, by the way, was on a real small bait. As but, well. Uh, as well, yeah. But, um, hmm. you know, I think, I almost just think it's uh, the uh, the old, it's a myth to say that you can't catch big blues drifting in cold water. I mean, I feel like that's yeah. debunked at this point. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. Thank God for, you know, guys like you. And thank God for guys that only anchor. That's oh, yeah, what yeah, I say yeah. all the time because that opens our mind so much. And, you know, when we see you catching these 100-pound fish in winter drifting, you know, that that helps tournament anglers, you know, and, and uh, recreational anglers who's like, man, you got to be on anchor to catch a big fish. And, um, you know, and then when we see uh, a guy that's, strictly anchors and he catches you know big fish dale low he's caught uh you know pound and a half short of the world record that's right he was on anchor sitting in one spot it helps us realize like okay it's really about looking for the fish getting in the area where there are fish and putting the bait in front of them that's it and covering know, some water and that and that, it's also awesome. you know it's a it's a pattern thing too just like we we're talking about earlier as far as um you know, if the fish are in creeks or what have you, um, whether or not you anchor or drift, I feel like that's just as much a pattern as anything else sure. as far as picking what is best. Now, for me, um, it just seems like on this body of water, Lake Gaston, the fish generally are roaming around more. And uh, when they're on this lower end of the lake, especially, it's a you know, huge body of water to cover. Um, I think covering more ground, running your planters, um, just just covering a lot of water is is going to be your best bet most of the time. Now that being said, uh, an example of a time when anchoring or spot locking might be better. Mm -hmm. We had a ton of rain here recently, and uh, they started running a bunch of a bunch of current, you know, open the, the dam up, and it was just, so we had a ton of water flow, and uh, I had a one of my clients has fished with me quite a few times and he fished two days with me. The first day we were drift fishing and man, we could not keep rods in the water. We're catching so many fish up to like 20, even 25 pounds. Nice fish. Yeah. Not giants. Um, and you know, he had a blast, but we wanted to get him. Uh, he had never caught a really big blue uh, or a really big catfish in general. And so the second day I told him, I said, uh, you can look up the generation um, for the dam here, they have like a three-day schedule. And I looked yeah. at it, I saw they were going to run uh, 22,000 CFS, which is a pretty good amount of current, and they're going to run it like all day. So I had already made a plan at that point. I said, I'm going to fish, uh, going to head up the lake, fish in some current, and uh, we're going to focus on um, basically anchor fishing. I, in current, I usually spot lock. Mm -hmm. It's not a replacement for an anchor, okay? You need to you need to have an anchor too, but mm -hmm. it's it's really great for like running from spot to spot. Like you pinpoint uh, a certain little area, mm -hmm. like a certain piece of structure, mm -hmm. and I'm not sitting directly over top of it. I'm pulling ahead of it, and I'm basically anchor fishing using yeah. the trolling motor. Yep. But um, that allows me to run and gun. I can hit a bunch of different spots. Yep. And that's what we were doing uh, with my client recently on on the day he caught. He ended up catching a 76 pounder. I hit several spots, uh, caught a, like a couple little fish, and then uh, I just kept going to structure waypoints I've collected over the years. And uh, this one was sitting behind a hump that has some uh, some brush on it. Yeah. And uh, current was ripping pretty good for here. But um, I, marked, I actually did mark that fish. Like I said, a lot of times I don't mark big fish that I catch. But this one I did see on my sonar. And what's nice, like when you're spot locking, is it's really easy to figure out exactly how far off yeah. that waypoint you are. That's right. Um, 
you know, any of your GPSs now, if you've got a waypoint and you hit it, it'll tell you how many feet away the right. road is from it. That's right. So I can get a really good idea with the trolling motor because you don't have any rope out. That's right. Okay, so you exactly pull up right. a little bit, a spot lock, and in, in current, uh, that thing will hold you dead straight if it's not wind. And, man, I kid you not, uh, I was going to fish uh, six rods. I was going to put out six rods in the current. But I didn't even, I think I had got four out. I mean, I hadn't even sat down yet, and I hear the line stretching. It's a... Anybody that's had that happen, that yeah. stinks out like oh, yeah. get your heart beating a little oh, faster. Oh, yeah, buddy. But, uh, God, man, I heard that stretch, and I knew drag was getting ready to rip. And sure enough, it was just, they had the, one of the medium lights just pegged down, pulling drag. And you're talking about the Big Cat Fever rods. Yeah, Big Cat Fever. Yeah. But uh, it gave us a heck of a good fight. But it uh, ended up being his biggest at, at 76 pounds. But, um, you know, I, I tell that story because... You know, I did something completely different. You know, I'm a guy that, I'm a drift fisherman. Yep, you're a mover. That's what I do. Yep. But I've learned to adapt. I mean, there's days when. Yeah. And I feel like if you're a hardcore anchor guy, you should do the same. Yep. Um, there should be times when you're willing to, you know, if you want to be as successful as you can. Yes, absolutely. There should be times when, let's say you go out and you're anchored up, hit a couple of your, your you know, main spots that you feel like you got a good chance of getting a big fish and, nothing's going on don't be afraid to right to switch over and that's right know, like i said i've adapted and kind of learned to do the same there's times when i'll go out especially if there's current um that's that's one time when uh well it makes drift fishing more difficult to to have your your presentation the way it should be anyway right um but when you have current you have that moving water you know, it's, it's, you've got a scent trail. That's right. You've got fish in a little, I feel like, more predictable spots. You know, they might be relating to structure like ledges a little more or humps. Right. They're not roaming around quite as Just much. something that they can kind of relate to that's and right. wait for yep. something to come to them. Exactly. You yeah, know, when that water's moving. And, and that's what that big fish I caught with my client recently, or he caught with me recently. Um, the 76 was, it was sitting behind that hump, like I said, on the back side of it. And they had, this was like the first day of the heavy generation, first or second day. And uh, there was a ton of stuff in the water. Uh, there was a bunch of bait around. And that fish was just, when they get big like that, they're gonna try to spend the least amount of energy possible right. to get that easy meal and keep getting big. That's how they keep That's getting. Right. That's bigger right. and bigger and bigger. Okay. They position themselves in places where the bait is going to come to them. Exactly, and and that's what that fish was doing. I'm I'm positive I was in a like an ambush. Yeah. Uh, mode, and the same happens drifting. Um, you know, you have fish like feel like those days when they're really active, they're roaming around. Um, so I'll I'll say this: I caught the 112 right in the middle of the channel, the old river channel. Um, that fish was not on any structure at all it was just it was just cruising down the channel there was some bait nearby um i usually keep a perch rod even if i if i have enough bait i like to keep one out because it tells me um you know where the perch are yeah and then the fishery is going to be nearby yeah um so I, I had a bait rod out and i was catching a few perch uh, so i knew the bait was in that area and that fish was just roaming around he was cruising around you know chasing bait but that day those really messy nasty days mm -hmm. super windy raining cold um those are the days that the fish i feel like are usually roaming around more yeah and then you know like post front um a, a day like this for example where we've had a cold front and you know just kind of uh, probably not your I guess prime conditions um, where fish are going to be out roaming around. Those are the days where, from what I've seen, are going to be related more to like your, your ledges and your mm -hmm. tight structure. Yep. Uh, but you know, you still you can still catch those fish drifting because if they're sitting behind that stuff and you pull it comes a over out, them. You know. I feel like, and I feel like the reason you are so successful catching these big fish, especially drifting all the time, is because you do pull planter boards and. Big fish, in my opinion, Zach, and I'm not the professional, you are, but you let me know what your thoughts are is, you know, you're getting the baits away from the boat because big fish are very aware of their environment. I Man, mean, they've lived there a long time. So 
by getting planer boards far out from away from the boat and then even a big fish that's really not even hungry like you said like a, a cold front when that bait's coming over them or beside them they have to make a decision either i can just turn my head and go boom or i'm just gonna look at it. so they have to make a decision and sometimes that might make that fish bite where he wasn't going to be feeding if you were sitting on anchor that's Do you think that's a fair statement oh man absolutely <laughs> um you know the first person that pointed that out to me was actually my dad uh, he taught me a lot about fishing uh, growing up, but um, he pointed that out to me. I don't know why I didn't think of it before, but uh, when I first started drift fishing a lot, uh, which had been quite some time ago, he said, you know, it it's, could be a reaction bite mm -hmm. as well. I was like, well, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, and I have seen where, I have seen where that is definitely the case. And I'll say that because I have, I have found fish stacked up in an area and catching them drifting, but I was like, all right, they're stacked up. Um, it'll be easier, just simply easier to anchor fish and target those fish mm -hmm. and I feel like keep bait right yeah, in front of them. Yeah, that's right. So then, you know, set up on top of them and hardly get a bite. Go back to drifting and start catching fish again. There you go. So, uh, Cause they're having to make a split decision and then it's gone. That, that's it, yeah. Yep. It, it doesn't give them a chance to to think about it that's right um and i think it could go both ways i think yeah. you're gonna have your times when the fish are really lethargic and they need um, to think about it and they and they want to sit there and look at the bait right um you know they may be less likely to bite drifting in that case but again it comes down to yet it comes down to putting four fish over 100 pounds in the boat <laughs> and you're drifting so well and, and you know you mentioned uh, getting lines away from the boat like the fish are aware of the boat. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll let this secret out. Um, and, and I'm sure there's plenty that, that already do this. But I see a lot of guys that start out drifting. And some that I know that have been doing it a while. And uh, I pay attention to what they're doing. And they're not putting their stuff far enough from the boat. Mm -hmm. They're not running their baits far enough i mean same with the planters yeah the point of the planters is spread out cover water and and get your bait away from the noise of the boat and the yep. motion and whatnot so you're 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 kind of hurting yourself when you're running them like 10 right. feet off the side of the boat yeah yep um you're not you're not getting a big spread but you're also not getting that bait far enough away from the boat yeah uh, a lot of times for your bigger fish yeah and same with your flat lines out the back, the ones with no boards on them. Because mm -hmm. I've run two straight out of the back all the time and uh, no planter on them. And then I run four planters. I have done six planters, but usually four. And uh, I can tell you this, all my big fish, I mean, and this even 70, 80 pound fish, all my really big fish have been on the lines farthest away from the boat. And that's been um mostly that's good information mostly on the far planter boards but also i've had some big ones on the flat line but this thing is like when i say far off the bat i'm using uh fathom 15s and 20s you know pretty good size reels i sometimes i've got them almost spooled you're getting them way back <laughs> yeah. there i mean these things are a mile back and uh I had but that's of, where the big fish are coming off of man most of the time yeah yeah um and like i said I, well all of my very biggest, I mean, 100% of them have been off the farthest line. There hasn't been a single one that wasn't. Wow, that's crazy. Well, I know um, the Alpha Board, Planner Boards, you are a big part in design process through that, and uh, that that's incredible. Um, and, I mean, obviously with the 112, you've had some success with them right off the bat. I yeah. mean, well, you're, you're the man for the job to test something out and put something, uh, you know, anything that I, I personally feel that, if you put your name on or and or be, you're a part of design and it's truly you, you've got a hundred percent conviction that it, it helps you put big fish in the boat and you've well, done just uh, that i appreciate that and it's uh that's definitely one thing i'll say is anything you see me um you know if i help with testing design um or if it's just something that i that i use and and promote and yep. recommend to people yep. i'm not somebody that's gonna you know recommend or push something that i don't truly believe in yeah you don't have to 
Yeah, I mean, that's I, the thing just, about you. You don't you don't have to, um, and and that's why people respect you. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. And Zach, before we go, because um, all the topics we brought into could bleed off into other channels of I mean, pre bait presentation, uh, preparing bait, and all these things. So we're gonna have to do another podcast because <laughs> you have some huge news that's about to get released, guys. Your head's gonna pop off. You're gonna be so excited. Uh, I'm excited, but nobody's saying nothing until. Uh, it, it, Zach's got all, all the loose ends tied up. Uh, Zach has just been an incredible angler who has just accomplished so much. And I'm going to leave you with one question, and that is, before we go, um, big fish, when you're catching a lot of fish in that 20-pound range and then talking about these 100-pound fish, do you see where these big fish – hang out by themselves or are you catching a few 20 pounders it's been a good day of fishing and then boom you just hooked a hammer um or is it it's kind of slow fishing you're not getting any bites nothing's happening and then bam 100 one of these 100 pound fish hit tell me about that because that lets me think do these big fish hang out with smaller fish or are they isolated um they're definitely isolated i'll say they tend to hang in packs though so the um, big fish the big fish, yeah, mm -hmm. not not a school like your your ten to fifteen pounders. Um, I mean, I want to really call blue cats a school in fish, but they end up in huge groups together. Yeah, they yeah, absolutely. Um, so an example is right now, if if you told me, hey man, I want to just go out and load a boat, catch as many fish as I possibly can. I've got a flat, a mud flat, I can fish right now, and uh, it is loaded. I mean. Just tons and tons of smaller five to fifteen pound fish. And the only reason they're there is just to feed. Yeah, they're just stacked up and they're feeding. And um, the problem is, that's all I've ever caught up there this time of year. Mm -hmm. um, you've got tons of numbers of that, you know, uh, size range, that class uh, fish up there. But your chances of catching a, a big fish up in that area uh, with all those smaller ones there. Um, you know, not impossible, anything's possible, but it's pretty slim. So, you know, if I'm targeting bigger fish, uh, usually I am fishing areas that don't have a lot of action. And sometimes guiding, you know, I've, I've had this conversation with people before, it's, it, it can be difficult when you're a full-time guide, if you're busy with clients a lot, to, uh, to target the bigger fish as much because a lot of your clients they'll tell you they prefer action. Sure. Know. And that's um, why you've been approached with that, where people say, man, Zach has only caught some of these big fish when they're by himself. And that is true because you are not stepping on the boat looking for a ton of action when you're going. To, and that's why it's important. You should absolutely book with Zach Royce. I'm telling you guys, he's got, he's, he keeps his schedule full but if you're watching this, you need to call Blues Brothers Guide Service. I don't care if you've been fishing for 50 years or if you're just getting started. Get a wealth of knowledge from him and communicate to him before you book what your expectations are. Hey, I want to come out here and learn um, how to drift and catch a bunch of fish. Or they say, Zach, I want to go big and then I want to go home. I want to right. go for a trophy size fish and then you can fish with them like you fish on your own with that expectation. And, and, and that <laughs> definitely, that's definitely what it comes down to. Um, I've got a client that uh, he's fishing me a couple times now and, and both times he says, go out and fish like you're by yourself, mm -hmm. like, like you're targeting big fish. He mm -hmm. said, I don't care if we catch fit, you know, smaller fish, you know, I'll have fun either way. But just treat it like going out fishing with a buddy. You're going out trying to target bigger fish. Yep. And, yep. Uh, you know, I have a handful of people that, that have that patience, clients that have enough patience to, they realize that when we do that, uh, we're going to sacrifice numbers. Yep. You know, and it, it's. But they want a shot at that big fish. And, and that's what I did recently with, uh, you know, I uh, was mentioning the client I had that caught the 76 with me. Well, the first day we caught all these fish and we talked with each other. He fished two days with me and he said, let's go for a big one. 
if, if we've, we've had a good day today, we've caught a bunch of numbers, so tomorrow let's target big fish. Worst yep. thing that happens, if we strike out on them, we tried. That's right. And so, you know, in my mind, I went home that evening, came up with a plan. You know, that that day when I got home, I was already mm -hmm. deciding what I wanted to do to. That's right. And that, that's how it is. You know, you have to, you kind of have to pick or choose. Like, do you want to just go out and load the boat, yep. catch a bunch of fish? Do you want to go out and have a chance at a monster? Because like I said. That's right. Or you can split it up half and half. Yeah, yeah. If it's a yeah. full day trip. Um, you know, we have enough time to do both. You can yeah. try to do both, but you know, generally, man, those targeting the bigger fish. Um, I'm not gonna say you can't go out on a, a four-hour trip and catch one. But you really want to designate plenty of time, right? Because you're gonna want to move around and cover a bunch of ground. Um, you know, it's. Uh, and that's what's nice about you. When somebody calls, you advise the client because just like me, I don't know. You know, I don't guide. I don't take people. I'm thinking, OK, well, we could try to go for numbers and then we try to go for a big fish. And you're doing calculations in your mind with your record of success where you're like, well, if you want the big fish, it's going to take a little bit more time. Not to say we couldn't do it. We you could you could do it in one hour if you got lucky, but you would need a full day. And you, you're able to advise clients and go after that expectation and that's that's right and, and try to and, meet it and man uh you know targeting the bigger fish um another thing about it and i meant to bring this up earlier i can't tell you how important it is to be willing to travel and fish different parts of the lake to, mm -hmm. to you know um be willing to make a long ride yeah that's um, right the the big one recently uh that i caught was on a different area of the lake than I had been fishing. I mean, mm -hmm. and that's the same with the, the 76 uh, I got, I think it was last week. Um, like I said, I went way up the lake, fished in current. So I'm chasing, I'm always chasing a bite. I mean, your blue cats migrate a lot. Um, there's studies, there's tagging studies done. Man, these things, they're machines, okay? They're moving all the time, migrating up and down the lake. But you've always got, you know, there's, there's enough of them in the lake to where you're gonna have some on each part of the lake. Sure, that's right. Some big fish. That's right. But you're chasing the bite. That's you're right. Chasing which ones are on the best feeding pattern, and uh, and then there's times you're like in the spring, when there's a big migration up, you know. So there's migrations you, you chase throughout the year, but also just from day to day, you're chasing that bite. You know where that big bite may be. So that's I right. cover a ton of water, not just you know, going out just drifting one area all the time. I'm moving way up and down the lake. I'm talking one day I might go 20, 25 miles up, and then the next day, you know, I'm 20 miles down. Uh, the lake is, you know, about 34 miles long, and I fish every single inch of it. I mean, I fish from Kerr Dam as far as you can go up to Gaston Dam. Um, and, and reading and, the conditions and time of the year to put you where you feel like you're going to get that best bite. That's it. And like I said, it, it comes down to the, the fish are migrating a lot, but there's also always resident fish on each part of the lake. And the water temperature and conditions and clarity can be so much different from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the upper end's got more current too. So sometimes when you start getting that a lot of flow coming down, you can run up there and, and get that early bite when that flow is first starting. If it kind of fires the fish yeah. up, you know, gets a lot of stuff moving. Um, so it, it's don't get locked in on one particular area of the lake. Like right. be willing to to move up and down. And um, that's killer. That's what I tell people so much when they say, "Oh, well, I, I saw where you were fishing today. You know, I got your spot or whatever." And I just you ain't got laugh. my spot. I was like, "Well." <laughs> My spot is from Bowie 34 to Bowie 31. So. That's right. I got a 34 mile spot. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's all about just, you know, finding where they're biting that particular week or day. Um, and then, like I said, uh, throughout the year, your, your big group of fish, there are times, you know, especially like in the spring, where they'll swim into that current. Yep. Up, upstream, it's a lot of water flow. So that's awesome man that's killer advice man and I, I can't thank you enough for sitting here and doing this podcast with us today and Zach how is the best way for people to get in touch with you to book a guide trip what's the best way they can do that uh, my website uh, 
has all my information as well as contact info. It's uh, bluesbrotherscharters.com. Uh, it's also got a calendar. Um, you select, you know, what type of trip you're interested in, and then the calendar comes up. You can book everything there. Uh, but like I said, my contact info is, is on the website as well. Good deal, um, good deal. Usually if I'm out on the water uh, with clients, I don't pay attention. I don't have my phone, Yep. Uh, you know, on a lot of the time. So um, if somebody calls me during the day, most of the time I'm going to be out on a trip. Yeah. Uh, you know, leave me a message. I, I return every voicemail, every email. Good. But uh, I can't, you know, when I'm Love out it. on the water, I can't answer the phone. You're giving the them full time attention. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So bluesbrotherscharters.com. That's it. That's got all your information. And then, of course, Zach Royce on Facebook. Uh, Blues Brothers God Service on Facebook as well, right? That's right. Yeah. Perfect. And, uh, guys, thank you so much for watching. Zach, thank you so much for giving us your time yeah, today and giving us just a piece of your knowledge because we're going to be doing another podcast with Zach here in the very near future going over some other stuff. And he's got some big things that he's cooking up. And uh, we're super excited about it. So thank you so much for watching the Fishing Fuel podcast. Of course, you can find us on uh, Fish and Fuel. Search Fish and Fuel on Facebook, Fish and Fuel on TikTok, Instagram. And uh, you can find us there. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you guys next time. And thank you for watching.